oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out we sing Lord of all the earth Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with Endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord. At your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name. Sings your story that your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out, and Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. We see there's no one like our God, there is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing, there's no one like our God. Praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing, there's no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God. We will sing. And Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, Lord of all the earth. We shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name.
thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy above prone to wonder Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love here's my heart Lord take and seal it seal it for thy courts above here's my heart here's my heart Lord take and seal it seal it for teach you guys a new song this morning. I'm really stoked to sing this song. And before I do that, I want to read from Psalm 23. Probably the most famous psalm of all time, but it's really, really important that we take the time to to listen to the words in this song. This is a psalm of David, and David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Reading that psalm, I think it would be appropriate to title it The Good Shepherd. And I love the promise that we have that God will never leave us or forsake us, that even in the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear because He is with us because he goes before us, he defends us, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. And we wanna sing this song called The Goodness of God this morning and I just wanna reflect on these words and remember just how good it is that there is a God that cares for us. Despite our failures and our shortcomings, he extends his hand when we are not good. He is good, he gives us mercy and he promises us that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. So let's remember that this morning as we sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing that verse again, I love you, Lord I love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice I love your voice. Oh, you have led me through the fire.
fire in darkest night. You are closer like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Cause all my and all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Oh, your goodness is running after It's running after Promise. 
Lord God in heaven, what a wonderful, wonderful praise and hymn we sing to you, God. Lord, you are gracious. You are a glorious king. And this morning, God, as we open your word, we say thank you for the opportunity to experience you not only in corporate worship, but as your spirit speaks to our hearts. Lord, I pray that this time we dedicate it to you, but I pray that this time would be you just manifesting yourself in our hearts and just speaking to us individually, God. Lord, open us to you. Let us hear your voice. Oh God, you are a gracious and loving God. We love you and we give this time to you. And everyone said, amen. Please be seated. All right, young people, kids, you're free to go. Mr. Mike is your man. He'll take you to the place. <laughs> nice job. We'll miss you, Mike. You know, and just so you know, our children is, is doing well. Carol Grebe is really um, blessing us and stepping up to the plate as we look for our children's director. So if God's put that on your heart, or maybe if you feel like you need to lead a certain aspect of children's ministry, we want to put that out to you and say, hey, this is a great opportunity for you to serve. That is a blessing. It's a blessing to serve the next generation. And it's kind of fun. I'm just doing a commercial real quick before we go any further, is understand that, that generally for someone to live a life for Christ, it's going to happen happen in those young years. It's going to happen. And so we want to we want to invest in our young people, our teenagers and our preteens and the little guys because that's when we cultivate their hearts for the Lord. I mean, the culture understands this. Why do you think they go after kids in all the ads? They don't care about us old people. They're going after the young pups. That's why they market to them. Why? Because they embrace it. They see it. I mean, so we rejoice when lives come to Christ. And this last week over at uh, the Boys Adventure Camp that Bob Nass is running, little Bryce came to know the Lord this week. So let's give God a hand for that one. I mean, for those of you that don't know, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's, that's forever. That's, that's an investment that's done for a lifetime. And so I was telling Bob this morning, I go, it's all worth it just for that one soul. 
you know? And we're here for that one soul. We're here for you. And, and our God is here for you, and we want to invest in ourselves. We want to invest in our young people. We want God to become alive in our hearts so the world sees him in us. That's my prayer. And I, there's times in my life when I blow it, and that's why I love the book of Jonah, because I have blown it continuously in my life, just as our hero in the book of Jonah has blown it. And I call him a hero in a loose term. But, but I think we can all relate to this story, but it shows how great our God is. I mean, come on. This is a wonderful testimony to God's loving grace and compassion and mercy towards an individual that we can embrace ourselves. Let me, let me give you a recap of Jonah. Basically, what is Jonah? He's known as the, uh, as the reluctant prophet. We always think of Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the big fish, and that kind of thing. But I want to do a real recap a little bit about who this Jonah guy is because some of you weren't here last week and I know this story is new to you and um, I say that tongue in cheek but in, um, I'm going to read the first two verses of chapter one and it says then the Lord God came to Jonah son of Anamatea saying arise and go to Nineveh the great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come before me so God has called Jonah, and he's saying, I want you to go to this city, Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital, it's capital of Syria, okay? The Assyrians are brutal, disgusting, evil people, and so Israel hates them. Jonah hates them. They torture people. I shared last week, it's how gruesome it is, and I went into a little bit more graphic detail, but they are scary, and people would commit suicide if they heard that they were coming because they didn't want to feel their wrath. So Jonah, knowing he hates them, he says, I'm out of here, God. I know you've called me, but I'm getting on the ship and I'm going a different direction. Now, he gets on a ship to Tarshish, which is about 2,500 miles away to the, to the tip of Spain. And so, so that's about a year's journey. Now, I was talking to Laura, my wife, about this, and, and we don't really know how long it took for God to get a hold of his heart. We always, I always think that he got on the ship and it was like he wasn't even out of the harbor yet and something happened. But we don't know if it took months. We don't know how long he was on that ship until God got a hold of him. Okay, we don't know until that storm came. And so we know the story, what happened. <clears throat> the storm, God provided this huge storm. And then the captain of the ship comes down and Jonah's in the, in the hull of the ship and he says, hey, pray to your God. Pray to your God. And Jonah says, no. I'm not praying to God because Jonah understands what prayer is. He understands it. It's a powerful weapon. He understands that, hey, if I talk to God, God's going to talk back to me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want God to speak to my heart. I don't want God to convict me. So I'm just going to ignore it. I'm in the bottom of the ship. He doesn't know I'm here. Shh, you know what he did. And so we hear this. We hear this guy as he's going, pray. And Jonah, a reluctant prophet, he says, no, I'm not going to pray. No, I'm not going to pray. See, I think this is a lot of us kind of. And I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of us that have kind of, we've walked in our life with God. We've done good things like Joe and I shared last week. He's probably a good guy. And then God some, provided something to happen that he didn't like or maybe you didn't like. And then soon we've just kind of put God on the shelf and we do the popcorn prayers we say, yeah, God, I pray, yeah, yeah, I believe, but we don't, we don't embrace it. And that's where our man is at. And I think a lot of us in the church are there. We, we hear and we give prayer lip service, but it's not really evident and real in our life. So today as we talk, we're gonna talk about praying like you believe in it. See, a lot of us, we pray, but we don't believe in it. I've been in Bible studies and men's groups where they will pray and they're praying for their wives, but they don't believe in it. I've been in places where women will pray and they'll fast and they'll do all this stuff that's showing and that they don't believe in it. I've been in youth groups where kids will pray these prayers just to sound spiritual. But they don't believe in it. They don't do it. And that's a sad part is we give God these token popcorn prayers. You know, we just throw them up there to God, whatever, but we don't do it. And then we get to a point in our life where we say these words, and I hate it. It says, all I can do is pray. You ever say that? 
All I can do now is pray. And I, I say, hey, you know what? No, no, no. What we should do right away is pray. You get to pray. And I don't like the words that we say, all we can do is pray. Because we don't, we don't act like it matters. We don't act like it can take effect in a hold of our lives. See, we pray only when it's the last resort, but we don't believe in it. I, I'm reminded of the story. Have you heard the story about the, the bar coming to town in middle America? This is a young town, a little town, and, and this guy comes into the town and he sets up a bar. And the pastor gets the church together. We can't handle this. We can't have this in our town because the riff and the raff will come in and it'll bring us down. So let's pray against the bar. Let's pray against it. So they pray and they have their prayer meetings and they're fasting and they pray. And what happens? God provides lightning and it strikes the bar and it burns the bar down. Well, the bar owner sues the church. And the bar owner sues the church and he goes to the to judge and goes, hey, they, they caused this. They, they prayed and God sent lightning and it burned my church down. It's their fault. And the pastor's saying, hey, no, no, no. We're just a little church. We can't do anything like that. We little prayers. We can't do it. And the judge goes, this is very interesting. Here I have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and a pastor who doesn't. See, a lot of times when push comes to shove, we don't necessarily believe in the power of prayer. But it does change our lives. It can change our communities, our church. And the thing is, is we try, I mean, we love busyness, don't we, church? We love, we go, new Bible study, new this, this will get people's attention, this will do it. And we are just going, yeah, this will spark interest. Maybe if we do more, maybe if we give more. You know what it takes is prayer so a heart will be changed. That's what we need. We need the Holy Spirit to change. But it comes through prayer. Billy Sunday said, if you are strangers to prayer, you're strangers to power. And I think a lot of us are strangers to it. And we give God the lip service, but we don't truly embrace it. And we gotta start embracing the power of prayer. And I believe in that, I love this quote. I've shared it with you many times because I believe in it. It works in my life, I've seen it. I've been praying, I've been praying God that you would change my attitude. And you know what, he does. Lord, I pray that you would work on me in this way, and he does. Maybe you need to start praying in those regards. Praying like you're expectant, that you expect God to do it because he wants to work. See, we know what happened to Jonah, and I want to share with you what's going on in his life here, and we're going to look back at verse 17. Look here, chapter 1, I'll read it to you. And it says, And the Lord appointed what? A great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach for three days and three nights. See, what we see here is here's Jonah. And he neglected prayer. And then God provided, appointed, he said, here's a ship, and, or here's a, here's, a, here's a fish, and I want this fish to do something. And now what we're going to see, he's in this belly of this fish for three days and three nights. Okay? Now, we're going to, in the next few verses in chapter 2, there's this beautiful prayer. Now, it's a wonderful prayer, but this is a snapshot because this prayer can be read in about 30 seconds eloquently. Okay, this is something he didn't necessarily pray and he penned it while he was in the stomach of the whale or the fish. This is just a brief synopsis of what was going on. He had three days and three nights as he was being digested by a fish to think it through. And this is where we get it. Let me read it to you in verse 1 and 2 here of Jonah. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Okay, so now he prayed. What happened? First of all, he's in a fish, okay? Not many of us. We stuck our hands in fishes. We've eaten fish. We've cleaned fish. But literally, we don't wear fish. And so here he is. He's inside the fish, and he decides this is a good time to pray. And then he prays to his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out in my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Shoal, and he heard my voice. 
You see, church, this is what I want you to understand. See, he's in the belly of this fish. He's in distress. He's in shoal. And what does God do? Listen to this. Write this down. God is ready to respond to my cry. Because we read in these verses that God, he's in there, he's in the, he's in the pit, he's in the, in the mire, he's in the yuck, and God heard him. Some of you might be in that mess right now. God is ready to respond. He's there. See, we, we get this, we, we, I, I left. You, you, you see what happened here? Jonah was the one who broke fellowship with God. He was the one that, that said, no God, my way. You see, God didn't break fellowship with Jonah. You know, now, you might be sitting there in your, your, your mess and you go, where is God? No, the question is, where have you been? See, God is waiting for you. I talked about the prodigal son last week. It's a great message. You should listen to it. Not really. But the thing is, is here he is. He's waiting earnestly for you to turn to him. And we don't. We complain. And we were the ones, you know. You know we can call to God. This is, this is the thing that, that's so wonderful about grace. When you sin, you can still call to God in the midst of it. He's, he wants to help you. You may not like the answer, but you can call to him, and he's raring to go. He's ready for you. He wants you to come. See, we have to remember that. Now, let's look at this. I want to look at verse 2 real quick again. It says this, and he said, I called to him in my distress to the Lord. I called out in my distress. That word distress is Sarah, like Sarah. Okay, Sarah, and what it means is basically it's this. It's, it's, a, it's the pain of childbirth. He's in agony, okay? We always think he called in his distress, help me God. No, he's in the belly of a fish. He's, he's thinking, game over. It's taken me three days to just get this far in this fish. He's gonna digest me. What is this going to look like? And he's in agony. The acids of the stomach of the fish are eating him. He's going, this hurts. He's going, where are you, God? He's in pain. Maybe you're in pain. And it goes on. Look what it says here in verse, in verse 2. And he said to him, and he cried out from in my distress, in my sarah, to the Lord. And he said to and he answered me. And I cried for help in the depth of my shoal. That means pit. That means hell. He's in pain in his own personal hell. And what? You heard my voice. That's where he's at. That's where he's at. You want to talk about, you've got pain. He's in this, he's in this fish. He's got pain. He's at the furthest point from God. He's in the middle of his death. In his agony. He's ran from God, and God heard him. Now, this might be speaking to you right now. I have talked to numerous people this week that are hurting, and they are just in that place. And they are at their wits' end, and they're going, why? And I don't have an answer, but I do have this, is we can cry out in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our pain, we have to understand, you might be going through some serious health issues. Maybe, maybe you're in a, in a marriage where it seems to be collapsing and it's not good. Maybe you're, you're on the other side of the marriage and you're just bouncing around and you're, you're living in that sin and you know it's not right. Maybe you're depressed. Or like me, I had a lot of anxiety this week. I mean, you go, anxiety? Yes. You know, so much, so much hurt. And you feel people's pain, and it just like eats you up, and you start getting chest pains, and you're stressed. I don't know where you're at, but you can cry out. 
See, church, when you have no place to turn, call on God, and he will answer you in your deepest pit. Call on him. See, so often we think we gotta wait and wait and wait. We call on him. We call on him. That's what we need to do. And then understand this, too. When you need him and deserve him the least, he will be there for you. I love that. Jonah deserved him the least. I mean, not only did, was he called in his life to do God's bidding, not only was he to be a man of God amongst people, he followed God and then he went against God. And, he got, and God got a hold of him and spoke to him. I love and I want to comfort you with this verse. And we see it in James 1, 5. It says, but if you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You see, what, what wisdom? Wisdom on how to handle our problems. Wisdom on what to do. Wisdom on how to respond. See, wisdom will help you in whatever situation because it comes from God, meaning he's going to guide your heart, guide your mind, guide your reaction. We can understand this and we can grab hold of this is a promise. You see, you see, ask. In James there, it says ask. That means beg. Beg. There is nothing wrong with begging God. You go, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I do. Please, God, help me in my distress. God wants to help us. And we got to be open to him. You see, he's going, Jonah's just going, hey, I'm in the belly of a well. And you know what happens? I always say, well, I'm sorry. It's just a kid thing in me. It comes up. You know what happens? I, I, I read this story, and, and Jonah can't do anything. He's stuck there. Probably with, with, you read further, he's got the seaweed wrapped around his head and his body. He's probably can't, he's immobile inside a fish. And so what does that mean? He can't do any sacrifices. He can't do any Hail Marys. He can't go out and serve anyone. He can't make things better. He can do nothing. All he can do is ask God for help. That's where we have to be as a church. I mean, if we, if we got on our knees and prayed for a new roof, I bet you God would provide the means to have a new roof. We need to do that. We need, we need children's directors and youth directors. We need those things. We need to get on our knees and ask God and see how he responds. In your life, your own personal life, are you begging God for something? Wow, what could happen? What could God do? He could do amazing things. Church, God is at work. I'll tell you this. And he's at work in us. We need to turn your heart to him. Turn our heart to him. Make it personal. He's at work. And so often we don't like that. We neglect it and we, we miss out. We, we miss out on how God is at work. We don't see it at all. We're like, we're like blind Christians. We don't see God in the little things so often, and so often we don't see him in the big things. You see, like, like the, the big thing of Bryce coming to know the Lord this week, that's huge, you know? And, and we don't, we don't, we, we say that's wonderful, but that's big. Glory is rejoicing. And, and we forget that. The big things are happening over the next door. I was joking as Mike left. He's a big guy doing big work to all those little big hearts. That's what it's all about. See, we can't miss out on that. See, we, we need to understand what God is doing. He's working around. So God was getting a hold of Jonah. And he's getting a hold of him in a great way. And, and there's phases. And I want to share this with you. Sometimes we go through phases with God. Sometimes God is trying to get a hold of us and we ignore it. Now, Christian, before I go any further in this, I pray that you would start to open your heart. Uh, if, you're, if you're a retiree, 
Start to open your heart and your eyes. Empty nesters, young people getting ready for college, everybody in between, open your heart because God is going to get a hold of you somehow. And I've been to the place where I don't want to be, but God had to take me there so I would listen. And if you start to turn your heart to God now, you might save yourself a lot of grief. So here's Jonah, who knew better, right? He's a man of God. He knows the power of prayer. He says, I'm not going to listen to God because those people are evil and wicked. And we can't blame him. We can't blame him for hating the Assyrians. I don't want to go there. I don't want God's redemption because they're evil. And maybe you're there, but you know what? There's some phases here. We see the phase here. It says, phase one, God sends a storm. That's our circumstances. He sent He sent a storm to say, hello, Jonah. And your storm in your life might be to get your attention. Are you focusing too much on something? He's sending something to get your attention. Are you being too selfish, too prideful, too self-centered, too humanistic in your worldview? Has modernism creeped into your theology? Whatever it is, he's saying, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of your heart. Then look at phase two. God sends the captain. He sends people into our lives to warn us. And so often we don't listen. We go, oh yeah, there's new good intentions. I went to the pastor and I, or I heard the pastor preach. Oh, that was a good thing. God sends people. Another chance. Then phase three. The sailors, they show him mercy. Those are examples because he's, just go, he's going, throw me into the drink. Get rid of me. And they go, no, 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 no. We're going to show you grace. We're not going to throw you overboard. We'll, oh, we'll get rid of all the cargo and we'll pray and put more sacrifices to our gods. So God might show you mercy in some areas and you might have a hiatus a little bit before. But you don't listen. Phase four, they tossed him to the deep. And the fish came. This is God's provision, believe it or not. God provided the storm, the deep, and the fish. And I shared last week that this was his his worst nightmare. And sometimes God has to provide our worst nightmare to get a hold of our hearts because we don't pay attention. And then phase five, wasn't pretty, but the fish vomited up Jonah. That's God's answered prayer. See, you might be right now in phase 10 of 49. Why, what is God trying to say? What is he trying to point out in our lives? What is he doing for us? We need to understand, because getting Getting vomited up, God's answer prayer, isn't going to be a fun thing. And sometimes his prayers don't, don't look like answered prayers at times, but maybe they are. So don't lose heart. We need to, to look at our hearts. Stop looking externally and look internally. What is God saying to us? See, God's saying, I want you You're important to me, anything I can do. And I'll tell you this, understand this, is your miracle might be taking place right now. Your fish might be taking place right now. You've been in through the mire and the muck and you are are disgusting and dripping and you're just saying, where is God in this? He's getting ready to throw you up on the shore. He's ready. Maybe this is your your wake up. See, because God teaches us. He redirects us. He guides us. He heals us. He corrects us to what? His ultimate will. And you may not like it. You may not like you. You have a worthy cause because the Syrians are bad in your life. They're evil. What those people did for you and to you. You know what they're like. And you have good cause to run from God. But God's saying, no, 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 no. I got plans for you. Are you gonna listen to me or are you gonna have to go through it? You're gonna pay attention. And sometimes we have to forgive. Sometimes we have to let those things, let let God take hold of our hearts. 
before you'll start working on others. I was telling a brother the other day, saying, saying, you know what? Right now, God is trying to get a hold of that person's heart. And he's using you. And you have to take on that person's pain because God's trying to get a hold of them. Because so often, you know what? When we sin, we hurt others. And maybe you are there and you're on, you're on the right side, but God is using you to help them. Isn't that amazing how God works sometimes? Sometimes somebody goes off the deep end and, and, and he asks us to take the brunt of their sin for his glory because that heart that's going wayward, God wants to get a hold of. And so if you're there, understand. Understand that sometimes God uses you for his glory. And if you're that wayward person and you're running from God and you're hurting hearts, understand this. When I go down, God brings me up. Be encouraged. Even if you're taking that pain for somebody when you're down because you're under the load of someone else's pain that they're causing you. When you go down, God is going to bring you up. We cry out to him. We go to him in prayer. He, he wants to bring us up. When there's nothing else we can do and we say all we can do is pray, yes. Because God wants to bring you up. Look, it just says it here in Jonah. In verse three through six, listen to this. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, and the breakers billowed o passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountain. The earth with its bars was around me forever. Look at, here it is. But you brought me up. My life from the pit. Oh God, oh Lord my God, you brought me up. See, he didn't do it. He didn't change anything. All he changed was going back to what he knew was right. God. God was there for him. When you don't feel like your life is going where you, where you want it to go, when it seems to go out of control, when you are so off the mark and you're just going, where is God? All this bad stuff's going back, uh, coming back on me. I don't know why. I don't know what. This isn't fair. Go back to the Lord. And he'll speak. But I'll tell you this, I brought it up earlier, is we can't miss. Look at this, church. Never forget the but God moments in our lives. See, so often we need to remember these because, yeah, we can say, man, I, life wasn't going as I, as I did, but then God. My health was failing, but God. I remember 20 years ago, my marriage was gonna fall apart, but God. I remember that, that I was gonna go to that party, but God provided my car not to start. But God, see God is at work. You might think that it's just circumstance, happenstance, whatever in your life, but God is trying to direct your path. Don't deny that. See, we live in a spiritual world. We live in, in a world where we try and answer everything with reason and shame on the Christian for saying reason is equal to God. We are not that person. God is a spiritual God that we cannot put in a box. To say reason and humanism can do that, we are missing out. No, God is so big. If I try and put my God in a box, I don't want to worship a God like that. I mean, that I have the answers to? No, 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 I go to the word of God. I still don't understand who God is. 
Shame on us for trying to do that. That's what the culture wants us to do. Our God is a God of miracles, is a star breather, is a God who makes the sun rise and the sun set, is a God who makes the earth move and the clouds rain. He can do great things in our lives. Man tries, we can develop weapons and things to make those things happen, but God is the one who makes things happen. He's the one with no effort, but God. Let me encourage you again. In, in Matthew 19, verse 26, it says, But looking at them, Jesus said, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things. We don't know what he has planned for you. He can pluck you out from where you're at and he can send you up and he can bring you up from that mire to do a great work, to pour into somebody's life, to change eternity forever. That's huge. He can do what man only thinks he can do. God can do it. He can change it. Look what Jonah said in verse 7. And he says, and while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. I think if, you, if you're going to underline something, I remembered the Lord. See, that's what he did. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. God heard his prayer. He remembered. Remember what God has done and will do again for you. He will answer your prayer. That's the beauty of it. See, we get this crazy idea that um, we don't think he can do those things. Or we think we can do it. I think this is the biggest sin. It was probably one of the biggest sins in my life was the, the self, um, uh, you know, sufficiency of, my, of me. I can do it. I don't need anybody else. My 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 problem in life as I look back is I never wanted to be dependent on people or my God. I loved God. I loved even, even preaching about him. But the reality is, is I let my self-sufficiency, my pull myself up by the bootstraps get in the way of what God would do. And until you confess that sin, you're going to have to deal with stuff. See, this is, this is what we have to do. What I had to do, I had that sin in my life of I don't need. And maybe you're there going, oh, I can do it myself. I can reason myself out of this. No, 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 no. We have to go to God in prayer and watch what he does. And this is what I want you to write down. Turn from what's holding you down. I mean, it's so simple. See, but you have to discover it. I mean, for me to really discover what my problem in life has been, has been self-analyzing. It's kind of like looking at, oh boy, you know, what, okay, so this led over here. I know better than this, this led over here. And then it's like, hey, this me wanting to be in control, this pride of you knowing best because we reason it through. This thing that we do, we do it so often. And God's saying, no, I, I got so much more in store for you. I got so much for you. See, God wants the best for his children. We can, we can read that story in John. I'm not going to go there right now. But, you know, God says, hey, of you evil dads, you know, your son asks for a, so, a, a little bit of, 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 of bread. You're not going to give him a scorpion. You know, No. Your God, when you ask him for something good, he's not going to give you something that's going to hurt. He's going to give you something that it might be a little painful to receive, but it's going to be a joyous thing. And we got to understand that's what our God wants for us. But we don't go to him in prayer and ask or beg. And we rather cling on to our idols those things that are holding us back. We'd rather grab hold of those things and just say, no, 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 my idol of self, my idol of intellect, my idol of me. And we do this. It says in Jonah, verse eight, it says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Ooh. See, we forfeit. Meaning, okay, remember how Jonah is the one that ran from God? 
he forfeit the relationship. He gave it up willingly. When you embrace an idol, and now I'm gonna be doing a series this fall and we're gonna take apart the actual idols we're gonna, and, and what they are in the Old Testament and how they've manifested themselves in the church today. And we're gonna, it's called No Other Gods and I wanna encourage you, get in a life group. We're gonna start sign-ups here because we're gonna take them apart. I mean, it's gonna be more like, more, more like a cultural study. But we're gonna say, hey, where are these in my life? What are they doing? Because we have let them manifest in our life and we have forfeit the love and the grace of God. We have missed out. And Jonah says, my idol was self. My idol was not what God's will was, my will. That's what my problem is or was. And that's what many of us have. So maybe you're desiring some things in your heart. And it could be a relationship. You're desiring that relationship. That, that relationship's now become your idol. Or fixing that relationship has become your idol. Isn't that weird how we do that? I'm going to fix him. I'm going to fix that man because he's going to, that will make it my, everything better in my life. Or I'm going to fix my relationship at work because that will make everything better. Or maybe it's pursuing something you desire. Maybe it's something really deep, you know. You just desire to be happy. You desire pleasure. And you've now put this idea of pleasure before God. You've desired, you want that one goal that you've always strived for. You want it, and you put that before God. So many of us do that. It could be a relationship. It could even be the adrenaline of success. I mean, I, I love that. We, we want something, the adrenaline. And, 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 you know, so often, I experience this at my, at my church in Colorado, and I experience it here, is, is we're not naive to the older generation, what you're going through, the younger folks in the church. Might be a little bit naive to it, but you know, the, the pastors and the board, we're not naive to the sexual sin that's going on with our older people. The desires for self and the deprivation that is causing in your relationships, the running away from your relationships. Those are, those are serious things. And we have to understand that just because we might be older in age, I know where we're at in our intellect. You might think you might have a 70-year-old body, but you think you're a 35-year-old stud, man. And you're going after it. And you, 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 gotta, you gotta understand, hey, what, what we're doing, we can't strive after the sinful nature. You know, we're here not to rekindle flames, men and women. We're here to go deeper in intimacy with the one that God has given us. See, so often in the self-help books, they say, they say, hey, you know what, you gotta rekindle and grab hold of how it used to be. No, you go deeper in how, where it could lead. Your marriage, your relationships are, are, are an example and a mirror of your relationship with Christ. If all you're experiencing is this superficial honeymoon period, no, you're missing out. You're supposed to go deeper and sell out to self more and more, not try to answer your needs. That's the culture saying it. God's saying you are my example to the world and to your family. Go for it. That's what we need to be. And finally, church, this is the wonderful thing. Wherever you're at, God, we gotta say, God, I will trust you to deliver me. Wherever you're at. You might be there where I just said, you might think, you know, hey, well, I'm gonna rekindle my flame. I'm gonna go after my wild oats in my latter half of my years. You know what? No. God can deliver you that from that selfishness, from that want. He can deliver you into something deeper and better. We don't know how he'll do it. For you young people, we don't know how he's going to deliver you, but he's going to. But you got to go to him in prayer. And Jonah, as we wrap this message up, in verse 9 it says, but I will sacrifice to you 
with the voice of thanksgiving of which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. You see, he's in the, in the fish. All he can do is pray. Just as our salvation, all we can do is ask God to save us. <clears throat> and God provides a way. He provided his son Jesus so we could have a relationship with him. Jesus opened the floodgates and the doors so all we do is accept him by grace. And we have relationship. In your pit, in your shoal, when you're ready to cry out and say, Sada, I need your help, God. All I can do is this. He will provide for you. Now, it won't be pretty. In verse 10, it says, Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited up, hit Jonah up onto dry land. See, in your shoal, in your pit, wherever you're at, God is there. Now, we don't know how he'll answer. And I tell you, it's not gonna be pretty for most of us. It might be sticky, stinky, and wet. And you'll get spit up in your life, but he will deliver you. He will get you out of that. And it might cause pain and hurt, because my guess is the convulsions in the fish and to, to spit him up onto dry land, it took a little bit of effort to get him through the, the mouth and out wasn't fun, but God delivered him. In church, God wants to deliver you. And now your life might have a curveball. It might have come to a point and you're saying, God, where are we going to go from here? You know, God says, you know, though that other person might be in sin and you're, in, you're, in, you're, you're taking off their pain, you know, they're not listening to me, but you are, I'm going to deliver you. And it may not be how you want, but I'm going to deliver you. And we have to embrace the fact that our God is a good God, that he wants those for us, that he's going to give us what we need. He gives us what we need, church. Like the birds of the air, they can't stock things away. God gives you what is needed. Be encouraged. Let me, let me read to you in Luke as we close. As I encourage you, it's in verse, it's in chapter 11, verses 9 and following. It says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And he who asks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose that your father asked by his son for a fish. He would not give him a snake. Instead, he will give him a fish. Or he will not, if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to his children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He gives you his Spirit. His Spirit will guide you. His spirit will direct your path. He will grant you wisdom on how to respond, on what to respond. God wants the best for his children. I'm a dad. I go out of my way for my kids. But your heavenly father, he didn't just send his son to die for us, which is way out of his way to give us salvation. No, that's just the beginning. He gave us something so much more, a relationship with him that we can invest in, that we can go back to and say, yes, I ran from you, God, but Lord, in my distress, I need you. Ah, oh, we love a God who loves us, don't we? He does wonders. Let him do a wonder in your heart. Philip, come on up. I'm excited about God and what he has in store for me, and I pray that you'd be excited too for what he has in store for you. You don't know what's gonna happen, but go to him and ask and wait to receive. It may not be pretty, but it will 
be a blessing. Just wait. Let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, you are a good God. You are a gracious God. All we have to do, God, is come to you and you hear our voice and you lift us up. Thank you for your forgiveness for our sins. Lord, I pray that repentance would be here, that we would turn from our sin and leave it behind and come back to you, God. Lord, I pray that you would identify the sin in our lives, that we're, we might think we're good. Please, God, show us. Show us so we can have victory. Lord, thank you for the encouragement of the book of Jonah. Thank, for, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the love that you have shown us. Lord, help us to bask, to live, and enjoy the grace that you offer us. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just more
Let's pray. Gracious God, we do praise you. Praise you, Jesus. We thank you so much for the grace that you have given us. We thank you for opportunity to remember how you've already blessed us, God. Help us to trust you in that place that we're at. Help us to trust you as we go forward today. Lord, we say thank you. Lord, to you be the glory. We ask your blessing over our fellowship time that we are gonna have now, God. We pray for the food. Let it be nourishing. Let this this time be uplifting and edifying to you, God. In your son Jesus' name, amen.